For the past five decades, Northern Ireland has been a deeply divided place. And for many of the communities here, those scars still run deep. But among the many stories of hatred, of conflict and violence, you'll find stories of hope, of compassion and forgiveness. In the town of Lurgan, around 18 miles from Belfast, lives Bridie McGoldrick. 23 years ago, her only child was shot and killed, a totally innocent victim of the Northern Irish Troubles. Bridie, you're from Bonnie, Scotland. Originally. From Glasgow? Yes. And you moved over here following your son? Yes, he, with me, he was married and when he, after they stayed in Scotland for two years and then Emma was born. And at four months, they decided, four months old, they decided they were going to come back here to live. And so when you came back to Northern Ireland then, it was coming back because your husband Michael was from this area. Well, he was from Portadown, yeah. and so was my mum and dad. Uh -huh. And my brother, my oldest brother, was born in Portadown. Did you find it difficult in any way coming to the huge division here between Catholics and Protestants? I or were didn't you used I, to that a bit in Glasgow? No, I, no although I'd been back and forward in holiday, I never really... I, I, it sounds really awful, but it had nothing to do with us. Nothing to do with us. Yeah. You know, so I didn't need really to think about it. Even though you were strong practising Catholic? Well, I was a practising Catholic. Like, you know, I mean, to say strong, I don't know if I can sort of say that at the time, uh, because it would be more through fear. Because you were brought up with hellfire and, you know. Oh, um, you know. So, on, yeah. so uh, I mean, we were growing up, we were never taught the Bible or... Or to even read the Bible. Yeah. So that really was my my faith then, if you want to see it. And your son, Michael, he was your only son? Our only child, yeah. Bridie's son, Michael, had just graduated from Queen's University when he was murdered for the simple fact that he was driving for a Catholic-owned taxi firm. Were you worried about him? I can imagine uh, during such a turbulent time here in the north having a, a once and once only. When was that? I remember saying to Michael, "Son, be careful," because mm. while I was at university, he drove a taxi part time, obviously to help to bring money into the house, and uh, I said, "Be careful, son." And he used, and he would look at me and say, "So who would hurt me?" She mm. an INS guy. He always said that. She an INS guy. And he wasn't involved in no, 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 the no, political no, no. sphere here. He wasn't no, active. No. He was just doing his own thing like no. you all were. His wife and his family, that was his that was his whole big bubble. It was his wife and family. He was the same age as myself. He was 31, 31 yeah. when he graduated. He graduated from Queen's, yeah. His whole life ahead of him. Whole life ahead of him. In the summer of 1996, members of the UVF broke the Loyalist ceasefire, renewing their terror tactic of random attacks on the nationalist community. In the early hours of Monday the 8th of July, three men got into Michael's taxi and shot him dead. And in, in the Monday morning, I remember, we got up and Michael turned the television on and it was on the teletext and it says, taxi man murdered. You know, but still never, nothing to do with us. And then it went on and it says, uh, Larkin. Then it said, uh, and married. And then it was the final sentence. And it said he just graduated from Queen's University. And that was how we knew it was our son. I couldn't think. I couldn't think at all. Uh, if it had been my child, I would have known. I would have known, so it couldn't be my, it, or it couldn't be. And the family all started coming, and I can remember all the people, and then I remember there was a doctor there, and he was trying to give me tablets, and I'm saying, no, I don't want them, because I knew if I had taken that tablet, my son was dead, because I could not, why would him to hurt my child? I mean, it was like me, he was Scottish, Do you know, it, we didn't, we didn't interfere with Andy, we didn't bother with Andy, we didn't, you know... He wasn't born in Northern Ireland, he wasn't no, part of the Troubles. No. So why would they hurt him? I mean, they would know as soon as he opened his mouth and talked. Bridie and her late husband, Michael Sr., were so devastated by the news that their son had been murdered that they came up with a plan to take their own lives. 
On the Tuesday night, Michael McGordy, his daddy, and me sat in that living room, and we had intended to commit suicide. It's just a few days later. Yeah, and he... Was that because you had come to the point, the brink, where you just had no hope whatsoever? Nothing left. Our whole world was just gone. So why were we here? I remember Michael was sitting, and he just looked at me. And he took my hand, I'll never forget it, and he over to the cross and went to and knelt down. And he just says, Lord, you handle us because we can't, we can't. And at that moment, suicide left us. Suicide, the idea of suicide just never came back into our lives. And Bridie, when you both knelt down in front of the cross, what changed inside you? that made you go from wanting to take your own life to suddenly wanting to live again? I can't say to you that I wanted to live again. That's not what was what my thought was. It was the fact that, do you really love me enough to take this burden off me, to help me? I can't explain this pain, you know. To, you know, The only person that can understand what you're talking about is somebody that's lost a child. They'll understand. At that time, I can't put a, an answer to it. We just knew, we just knew, we knew. I remember that Michael had said to me, like he was talking, and he says, do you know, Brady, we have to remember the guy that shot Michael. He says, Jesus was standing there. He says, he was holding Michael. He said, but he was holding that fella. I said, don't do it. But he couldn't interfere in the free will. So... And you're sort That's of a very thinking, compassionate way of looking at it. I mean, did it take you a while to I, see it I, that way? I, no, he was saying it to me. And although I sort of knew it was true, I didn't really think, why would Jesus love him more than he loved my child? Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's the kind of scenario of it. And I said, there was no way that God wanted Michael to die. No way. Mm-hmm. You know, not even murdered. No way. That was not God's plan. Mm-hmm. It's not God's plan for my son. That was man's plan that did that. It wasn't God, it was man that did that. You were asking God, why did you stand by it and watch my son being killed? He had to stand by it and watch his son being killed. You know, it, you can't, it's, it's awful hard to explain. It's a feeling deep within you, deep, deep, deep within you. Michael's murder drew significant attention from regional and national media as it had the distinct appearance of paramilitary-type execution during a ceasefire. But it was Bridie and Michael Sr.'s message that began to change hearts. I don't want any mother or father going through what my wife and I have went through today. Another thing, to those that have done this, I, I firmly forgive you. And Bridie, how was your life affected within the community here in Northern Ireland? Let's say before this, as you said, you were outside of the Troubles. Yeah. You were from Glasgow, um, you're so much from Glasgow, but now you've been left with a scar. It wasn't just once the act of forgiveness, it's every day. It's every day of my life since the day my son was killed. Every day I have to ask God for the grace. Because we didn't forgive, I did not forgive the man who murdered my son. I, no way did I. God gave me the grace to do it. It was God that he gave me the grace. But you did it with the help of others, didn't you? And you didn't uh, draw back into just the strong Catholic community. There was a lot of interfaith oh, yeah, services and, oh, you were at. And, you... and it was such an eye-opening. It was such... To know that... I mean, there was all thought about, you know, Catholic and Protestant, the hate and the hate and the hate. But yet you were here with Catholics and Protestants who loved and praised and prayed together. Do you know, uh-huh. that's going on, but no, nobody was telling. Nobody yeah. was, there Is was no publicity The media there. didn't focus on that. Well, the media uh, told us that good news does not sell newspapers. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, that's true. Lord, thank you for the sunrise. And also, thank you for the sunset. The sunset. Reminds me of my tears, but without my tears, there wouldn't have been the love. Without my heartbreak, there wouldn't have been the love. And I thank you for that. Amen. <laughs>